So, I'll switch to English now, though, so I'll, I'll not butcher la your language anymore. I, I did actually take Russian uh, for three years, back um, 30 years ago. Uh, so I may understand if you're speaking about me about, you know, behind my back, but apart from that, I don't really speak the language anymore. I'm sorry about that. Um, but, so that's basically uh, enough about me. If you want to know more about me, uh, there's information there on blog the Plur the DK. You can go and read all about me. And I'm on Twitter at uh, Plur. And um, if, you, if you'd like to tweet from this session, you should be more than welcome. The, the person who tweets the most wins a free subscri subscription to the blog. Uh. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> So um, some years ago, I wrote a book called Dependency Injection in .NET. And uh, since the title of this talk is From Dependency Injection to Dependency Rejection, uh, you probably expect me to reject everything that I wrote in that book. And that's not going to happen. Um, I'm actually quite happy that I wrote the book. Uh, I think uh, it, um, it provides good guidance if you're doing object-oriented programming. So, um, you know, dependency injection is a way to address various um, concerns about your software or your code base, uh, particularly uh, decoupling, separation of concerns, testability, stuff like that. And if you're doing object-oriented programming, dependency injection is a well understood and battle tested uh, way to achieve those goals. So, um, so that's fine. Um, but about the same time as I wrote the book, I started to become interested in functional programming. And uh, you know, I've been coming uh, increasingly interested in functional programming over the last couple of years. So that's basically what I've spent most of my time on today. And um, because of that, you know, sometimes it happens that people ask me, so how do you do dependency injection in functional programming? So that's what this talk is about. Um, so throughout the next 50 minutes, I'm going to say some things that, you know, if you take them a little bit out of context, they might actually sound strange. Uh, so in order to try to prevent any sort of confusion, I'm going to start with a conclusion, just to make sure that everyone understands where this is going. So f the first thing that I want everyone to understand is that if you're doing object-oriented programming, dependency injection is still a valid approach. Now, if you want to solve the same concerns about testability and decoupling in functional programming, uh, what could you do instead? So we'll look at a couple of alternatives. The first one is that we can use something called partial application. And, and if you don't know what that is, that's fine. Um, I'll tell you as we go along. Now, um, it turns out, though, that uh, that's actually not a particularly uh, functional thing to do. And uh, if, you, if you already do know what partial application is, you may think, well, but partial application is a very functional thing to do, which is true, but it's just used in this particular way turns out to be not very functional. Um, so once we've established uh, why that is, we'll also need to figure out, OK, so what do we do instead? Uh, so another alternative is to use something that we could call function composition. So this is basically the conclusion of the talk and also the agenda for the next uh, 50 minutes. So this is what we're going to cover. So we'll start with uh, just like, doing a review of object-oriented programming and looking at you know, dependency injection and why it looks the way that it does. So what's dependency injection? Well, you know, Rune Bjarnason says it's just a pretentious way of saying taking an argument. And there's probably some truth um, to that, uh, but it also turns out that it's not quite um, the whole story, I think. So we'll need Is it just taking an argument, or is there more to it? Um, and in order to figure that out, I think we should uh, look at an example. Uh, so we're basically going to look at the same example scenario all the way through this talk. I'm going to show you this, the code in, in various uh, stages and in various languages. Um, so the, um, the scenario is my favorite scenario. It's online restaurant reservation system. So these already exist, but we can imagine that we need to develop yet another one of those. So um, just to make sure that everyone understands what we're talking about, you can imagine that you, need, uh, you want to make a reservation at a restaurant. Uh, so you find a, a website or an app or something like that, and there's a form, and you fill in the form with some data. And uh, oh, by the way, this is my real email address. You know, all the spammers already have it, so you might as well have it as well. You, you're welcome to write. Um, but what's going to happen when you press the Submit button is that it's going to generate a little JSON document, and it's going to do an HTTP post with that JSON document against some sort of HTTP endpoint. Some people might want to like uh, to call that a REST API. 
whatever. So the code that we're going to look at is you know, the endpoint that handles that incoming uh, post request with that JSON document. And just to make sure that everything is, is uh, clear, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cover five steps. Uh, so we'll just briefly cover what those five steps are going to be. So the first thing we want to do is to validate the input uh, because it's JSON and it, it might be malformed. But um, if it's uh, valid, we understand the request. Uh, we can query our database uh, to figure out whether we have some reservations for that particular time slot uh, already. That might be the case. So once we know that, uh, we can make a business decision uh, because it might turn out that we're sold out for that particular time slot. Uh, so we may want or we may need to reject uh, the reservation, but we can also decide to accept it. And if we decide to accept it, well, the fourth step is to save the reservation into the same database as before. And then the fifth step is just to create an HTTP response. Uh, so that's the happy path scenario. So um, there might be some shortcuts needed in various cases. For example, if validation fails, um, there's no reason to go through all this reading from database and stuff, uh, you'll, but you will still need to create a response. And also, if we decide not to accept the reservation, there's no reason to save the reservation in the database, but we'll still need to create an HTTP response. So, uh, so that's basically what, we, what we'll try to cover. And um, as the uh, outline of the agenda is sort of already predicted, we'll start by looking at how does that actually look in object-oriented programming, because we'll sort of need to figure out, okay, why does dependency injection look the way that it, that it does? Um, so since we're doing object-oriented programming, we'll start with a class. Um, so we'll just start with a class called Reservations Controller. Um, it derives some, from something called an API controller. And for those of you who care, this is ASP.NET Web API, but you, know, you don't really need to understand how that web framework works because that's really not important. Um, so it's just a base class. Now, in order to handle that incoming JSON document, uh, I'll add a method called post. And uh, in that post method, we'll have an argument called reservation request DTO. And DTO is just short for data transfer object. That's the design pattern that Martin Fowler described uh, many years ago. Uh, so it's just the C-sharp representation of the JSON document. It just contains date, name, email, and quantity. So it's just a dumb data object. Right, so what we're trying to figure out right now is whether Runa Bjarnason is right that uh, dependence injection is just a pretentious way of saying uh, taking an argument. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to look at how we would factor this code in such a way that it actually delegates some of the work to some collaborating objects. Um, so the first collaborating object that we might have is we might have some sort of validator object. So we could say, well, we'll ask the validator object to validate the, the uh, DTO, and if uh, validator a bad request. I think it's 400 anyway. Um, and then you may say, and then you may be wondering, so where does validator come from? That's what we're trying to figure out. So I'll just go a little bit further into the code and then we'll try to figure out, okay, well, where do those objects actually come from? So, so that's one uh, collaborating object. The next thing we might want to do is to say, well, now we know that the DTO is valid, so we'll, we'll like to translate that into some sort of domain object. So I'll just call mapper.map, and R is just, uh, is just shorthand for reservation there. So I was being lazy there. You shouldn't, you shouldn't name your variables like that. That's, that's horrible. Um, if you're really into domain-driven design, uh, you could uh, try to adopt what uh, Eric Evans calls uh, the ubiquitous language of whatever domain, in this case, the domain of, of restaurant reservations. Uh, so if you walk into a real restaurant um, and ask them whether they have a table for four people, at least in certain restaurants, you'll be interacting with someone called the maitre d'. So we could have a, an object called maitre d', and we can ask that object whether it could accept this particular reservation, and it'll return a reservation ID, and if it turns out that that ID is null, we'll return 403 forbidden, another Otherwise, we'll return 200 OK. Uh, so, uh, so this is the, the basic idea about it. Uh, so I'm not particularly a fan of using null for control flow, but um, lots of people do that. So I think that's a realistic example. So there's a couple of things missing here. I was talking about going through five steps, and there are some of the steps that are, that are missing still. We'll get back to those shortly. Uh, but what, what we really need to figure out now is so we have three objects that we collaborate with. There's the validator, there's the um, mapper, and there's the maitre d' object. So where do those things come from? So Runa Bjarnason suggests that dependency injection is just a pretentious way of saying taking an argument. So could we just you know, take these three objects and pass them as arguments to the post method? Uh, 
Now, that unfortunately turns out to be not possible because the way that you know, most web frameworks work these days, and this one is no exception, is that it'll happily wire everything up by convention. So when it sees a post request to slash reservations, it'll be happy to pull out all sorts of information out of that HTTP request and uh, you know, wire it up by convention. Uh, but validator, mapper, and maitre d are not runtime values, if you will. Um, so that's not, that's not going to work. So we'll have to settle for the next, next, uh, the next best uh, thing, and that is still we'll pass them as argument, but we'll pass those objects as arguments to the constructor instead. So we'll save them in class fields for later use, and this is how uh, that's basically going to work. So this is called constructor injection, and that's basically how dependency injection works uh, you know, all the way down. So you may argue, though, that the, this is a little bit of a straw man argument, because uh, in this particular controller class here, this is where I need to interface with the web framework, and I have to play by the web framework's rules. So uh, what if I, um, I don't have those constraints anymore? Uh, could I, couldn't I just pass the dependencies as, as arguments to the methods? So let's dive into our own code. Uh, so the next thing we're going to look at is this maitre d object. So we have this maitre d class, and the maitre d class needs to have a uh, method called try accept that takes a reservation as input and returns a nullable int as output. Um, so let's just walk through the steps uh, that uh, are missing from that five-step plan. The first thing we need to figure out is how many reservations we already have. So I'll be interacting here with the reservations repository, and I'll ask it to read the reservations for a particular date, and I'm just going to su do a sum of all the quantities. So reserved seats is just an integer. It's just the number of reserved seats for that particular date. And once I have that information, I can make the business decision. So I can say, well, if the reserved seeds plus the requested new quantity, if that's, if that's less than or equal to the capacity of the restaurant, um, I can set is accepted to true, and I can call reservations repository.create. And that method is intended to return the, you know, the row ID from the database, and we'll just return that. It's going to be cast into a nullable int there. Otherwise, we'll just return null. So again, we have dependencies here. We have at least this repository that we're trying to interact with. Uh, so again, you might wonder, okay, so can we just you know, add that repository as an extra method argument there? Uh, because that's what Runa Bjarnason says that we can do. And unfortunately, again, that doesn't really seem to work because uh, you know, maitre d needs to implement this interface called iMaitre d, and iMaitre d defines a method called try accept that has to have this particular signature. Um, and the signature doesn't allow us to add more arguments uh, to the method. So uh, if we try to add the repository as an extra argument, it wouldn't compile. So you could argue that if we own the interface ourselves, we could just add them to the interface as well, and then it would uh, compile. So technically, that would, could be a solution, but then we'd be introducing what we call a um, leaky abstraction, um, because the fact that this particular implementation uses a repository and so on, uh, that's an implementation detail. And we don't want uh, that to go into the abstraction. I think the abstraction here is actually pretty neat. Uh, we have a reservation. That's what's going to arrive via HTTP. And then we'll return a nullable int, which basically is you know, a reservation ID if we accepted the reservation and null uh, otherwise. Um, so that's a, f that's a pretty good abstraction. I don't want to pollute that abstraction. So again, we'll have to settle for the next, next best thing and just pass those things in as, as uh, constructor arguments. So dependency injection basically tends to work that way all the way down. You can have you know, uh, you know, deep graphs uh, that basically all just work like this using constructor injection. Um, so, so that's basically why we, t why we tend to use dependency injection in this particular way. And I think it's a nice pattern because we have the abstraction, and the abstraction is described in the interface and is implemented by the methods. Uh, so we could say everything that is sort of belongs to the abstraction is part of the methods, but then what goes into the constructor is all the implementation details. So you have a pretty good separation of concerns there already. So I think uh, that's actually not a bad uh, way to structure code. So before we move on, uh, that was just a little review of doing object-oriented programming with dependency injection. Before we move on, um, I'd like to call your attention to a couple of things. The first thing is that you will notice that one of the dependencies there is the capacity of the restaurant. And that's just an integer. And some people don't think about integers or similar primitive types as being dependencies because they're not really objects. Um, but the try accept method here actually depends on that particular piece of information. So it's not going to work if that information is not present. Uh, so I would say that this is very much a dependency. 
Now, the other thing here is that um, we have the uh, repository, uh, and if we look at how we interact with the repository, you'll see that um, first off, uh, in the beginning of the method, we call read reservations, and then second, uh, later on, we call create. So we're basically interacting with the repository via those two methods. Um, so iReservations repository is an interface. It might have other methods as well, uh, but we don't care because we don't depend on those other methods. We just depend on those two methods, and then we depend on the integer, the capacity there. So if we try to really you know, decompose everything into stuff that can't be decomposed any further, we have three dependencies, two methods and an integer. So that becomes important in uh, five minutes' time. So that was just a little review of, of dependency injection in object-oriented code. So how do you do dependency injection in functional programming? So, so this comic talks about Scala, but basically you can replace Scala with any other name of any other functional language. Well, you don't because Scala is a functional language. Fine, it's functional. How do I in inject dependencies? Well, you use a free monad, which allows you to build a monad from any functor. Did you just tell me to go fuck myself? <laughs> I believe I did, Bob. Yeah. So, um, so apart from being funny, um, this this comic uh, does contain some degree of truth. Because first of all, there there is a category of functional programmers that, if you ask them that question, they will tell you to use a free monad, and a free monad will allow you to build a monad from any functor. So all of that is true. It's also, if if you're the um, if you're the guy on the left-hand side there, it's not a particularly useful answer, though, uh, because what's a free monad? What's a monad? What's a functor? Uh, perhaps you don't know those things. And uh, I'm not assuming that you know any of those things. And in fact, I'm not really, I don't really want to go there. So all of it is true, but it also turns out that for the majority of the cases I've ever seen, you don't really need that. You know, you could, but and it's you know a general purpose uh, you know uh, solution. Um, but most of the cases, you actually don't need to make it so complicated. So I'm just going to stick with something that is that almost always works, and is much simpler. So if you ask, uh, let's say, an F# -sharp programmer, how do you do functional or how do you do dependency injection in F# -sharp, they'll tell you to use something called partial application. Uh, so that's what we're going to look at next. So I'm not assuming that you uh, know what a partial application is. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you as we go along. And we'll look at how that sort of relates to dependency injection. So um, what I really want to do is now to take the maitre d code that you saw in C Sharp before and rewrite it in F Sharp. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm not assuming that you can all uh, read F Sharp. Now, if you can, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to assume that you can't. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through the parts of the code that you need to understand. So this is the beginning of a function in F Sharp. And right now, it doesn't compile because I haven't you know, written it all the way through. Um, but when it's going to finally compile, it's going to have the type that I'll try to indicate with comments there uh, on the top there. But if you look at the bottom line, it starts with let try accept. So try accept is the name of the function. And you can imagine that the function sits in a module called maitre d. So it's basically trying to do the same thing as the try accept method in the maitre d object. And then it says capacity, read reservation, create reservation, and reservation. So um, there are four words there. And those are just arguments to the function. So in F sharp, we don't use brackets around you know, method arguments or commas in between them. We just you know, use space, and that's, that's all fine. So this is a function that takes four arguments. And we can briefly try to understand what those arguments are. If you look at the, um, and the comments up there, you can see the first one is an int. So capacity is an int. And this, is, this totally corresponds to the capacity dependency that we had in the object before. Uh, this is just the capacity of the restaurant. It's just an integer. Now, the next argument is called, cre uh, is called read reservation. And if you look at the comments up there, um, you will see in brackets, it says datetime offset arrow reservation list. So this is a function. This is a function that takes a daytime offset in, uh, value as input and returns a reservation list as output. So the intent here is that we can query, uh, for example, some sort of uh, database, and it'll return a list of reservations uh, that corresponds to this particular daytime offset value. So we're passing a function as an argument to another function, which is a perfectly normal thing to do in functional programming. And if you've been doing any sort of C-sharp development for the last 10 years, you will know how to do that in C-sharp as well, because it's just you know, la lambda expressions uh, in Link is basically how that works. 
Now, uh, the third argument is called create reservation, and it's a function as well. It's a function that takes a reservation as input, returns an int as output. So here the intent is that we could call or you know, ask uh, some database code to add that reservation to the database, and it will return the ID of the row that it just created. That's the intent. Uh, so you'll notice that these two functions that I'm passing as arguments basically plays the same role as the repository you saw before. It's just that I didn't, I didn't want to you know, go to, th to the extra work of actually defining an interface uh, because I just need those two functions. And I could just pass functions as you know, anonymous dependencies or arg function arguments here. So that's much easier. And the uh, fourth argument is the reservation uh, value that we're trying to figure out whether or not we can accept. And then on the next uh, line in the, um, in the comments there, it's, it says int option. So that basically means I want the function to return something called an int option. Um, it's basically like a nullable int, uh, apart from the fact that this is actually probably type safe, which um, anything that involves null in C-sharp is not. Um, and null is really horrible, but uh, options are not. So, um, so that's another thing. So we'll see what that looks like in a moment. So I wanted to go through the same steps as you saw in the C-sharp code before. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out the number of already reserved seats. So the way that that happens is that we'll start by calling read reservations. That's just a function, so we can just call it. Uh, we'll call it with the reservation date. And then you'll notice that just to the right of reservation date, there's this vertical bar and a greater than sign. Uh, and that's a um, pipe operator. So if you've ever done any sort of PowerShell scripting or bash scripting, you probably know about um, pipe operators already. Uh, it basically just means take the value of the expression on the left-hand side and use it as an input argument to the expression on the right-hand side. So in this case, we're calling read reservations uh, with the reservation date. That returns a reservation list. That reservation list is then being used as an argument to list dot sum by, and we're just doing a sum over all the quantities. So reserved seats here is just an integer, just like uh, you saw in the C sharp code as well. It's just a different way of writing that. But you'll see that pipeline operator in F sharp all the time when you see F sharp code, also in this talk. The next thing we're going to do, that now we sort of have all the information we need, we can make a decision. So we'll just make, make basically the same uh, if-then-else uh, decision as uh, you saw previously. So in the then case, what we're going to do is we're going to call create reservation, that other argument that was passed in with a reservation. That's going to return an integer, you know, the, the ID of the row that it created in the database, probably. And then uh, we take that uh, integer and we pipe it into sum. So sum means that that's an option value where there is actually a value inside of it. Uh, and otherwise, in the last line there, else none would just return none, which means that's an integer that's not there. Um. Right. So, um, so now we have a function that takes four arguments, and you sort of, you, I think, I hope you can see that the th first three arguments there, they sort of cons correspond to the dependencies that we have in, uh, in the object-oriented code. So it's sort of like, yeah, in functional programming, you know, dependency injection is basically just passing an argument. So that seems, uh, that seems like maybe Runa Bjarnason is right all along. Uh, so we have a function that takes four arguments, sort of three dependencies, as a, and a runtime value. So um, how do we compose stuff like that? So if you remember the IMHOD interface that I had in C Sharp, uh, that defined a method called try accept uh, that took a reservation as input and returned a nullable int as output. I sort of would like to have the same sort of abstraction here. So I'd really like to have some sort of composition that could take a reservation as input and return an int option as output. Um, so um, that's possible if I have a module, like we can imagine that I have a module already called DB, and the DB module contains all sorts of, of code that actually enables me to talk to a real database. Uh, so it might, for example, have a, a function called uh, read reservations, and the read reservation has the, this type here. So the way that we read this is that it's a function that takes two arguments. Uh, the first argument is a string, the next argument is a date time offset value, and then it returns a reservation list. So the string is a connection string. So you can imagine you already have a connection string. Uh, you probably read that from a configuration file or whatever. So what happens if you call this function that takes two arguments with only one argument? Uh, you can do that. You can call it with a connection string that you have. And that actually works. You know, this is something that, is, that you can't really do in C Sharp. Um, but this is what's called partial application. You're partially applying a function. You're calling the function with only some of the arguments. So what you get back from that is a new function that is remembering the arguments you just passed to it, uh, but it's still waiting for the arguments you didn't supply. So this is a function that's still waiting for daytime offset value. And whenever you give it a daytime offset value, it remembers the connection string, and then it could give you a reservation list back. So 
you can keep on doing that. So if you have uh, similarly a create reservation uh, function, you can partially apply that with a connection string, and you get a function that takes a reservation and returns an integer. So now we basically have we have a read and we have a create uh, function. So we can just call try accept with all four arguments. So I'm just going to hard code the capacity of the restaurant to 10. Very small, very intimate restaurant. Those do exist, though. Um, so I'll just say try accept 10 read create reservation. Uh, so this is a function call. I try accept is a function that takes four arguments, and I'm supplying all four arguments here. Um, so, so that's just going to call the function, and then uh, this whole expression there is then going to return the re return value from try accept. So in F sharp, we don't have any explicit return keyword or anything. It's just the last expression becomes the return value. So because try accept returns int option, then this entire composition also returns int option. And this works just like you'd uh, expect it to work. It does exactly the same thing as the composition did in, in C Sharp that you saw before. Now, one thing we can do is um, we have reservation on both sides of the equal sign, as you can see here. And sometimes it's a little bit like in mathematics. Uh, if you have um, you know, something that appears on both sides of the equal sign, sometimes you can remove it. Uh, the rules are a little bit different uh, here in, uh, in F sharp and, and other languages. But in this particular case, we can perform something called an eta reduction. So I can just remove uh, both occurrences of reservation there. So um, the reason why this is interesting is if you, if you now consider the last line of code there, it says try accept 10 read create. So it's calling a function with three arguments, but the function expects four arguments. So this is a partially applied function. Now I've applied it with all the dependencies, but it's still waiting for the runtime value. So that's very similar to what we did uh, with dependency injection. And the really interesting reason why uh, this is um, a fun thing to do is if you take F-sharp and you compile it, it compiles to IL, you know, intermediate language, and you can take that IL and you can decompile it to C-sharp in order to have an understanding of what the IL looks like, and if you do that, you get something like this. So you get a class, and it has a funny name, and I had to clean it up a little bit. It's actually, it doesn't look as pretty as this, um, but we'll notice a couple of things about this class. First of all, the class has three fields, the capacity and two functions. The class also has a constructor that takes three arguments to the constructor and saves those arguments to the field. And then, you know, in the bottom here, there, there's, a, there's an invoke uh, method that basically just takes those three class fields and the runtime value, the reservation value, and it just calls in to try accept that function that took all four arguments. So this is really, really something that we already know how it works. You know, that's, that basically goes to show that partial application in F sharp used this particular way is dependent injection. It's, it's not even sort of the same thing. It is the same thing. It compiles to the same IL. So that's, that's quite of interesting. Uh, so, so if the only thing you cared about is, you know, how do I do dependency injection in F sharp, then that's the answer. You just use partial application and uh, you're done. Um, and we know that it works because we've been doing dependency injection in, in uh, .NET for many years, so th this compiles to the same sort of IL, so, so that ought to work as well. No, no difference there. So we could stop here and just say, okay, I, I now have the, an the answer that I need. Um, I'm happy I can go home. Now, if you want to know more, sometimes when I'm talking about F-sharp programming, some people ask me, well, but, you know, how do I know that my F-sharp is functional? So we could ask, is this functional? Um, so how do we know whether or not F-sharp is functional? Well, the first thing we probably need to establish is, okay, what, what do we mean when we say that something is functional? Um, so I'll just do a little bit of detour around that in order to tell you my criterion for evaluating whether, whether or not something is functional. So because most people will tell you, you know, it's about immutability or whatever, uh, but I think this, uh, there's a more fundamental way to define what's functional. Uh, so in functional programming, we like these things called pure functions. Uh, and a pure function is a function that has to obey certain rules. There are two rules that it has to obey. The first one is that for the same input value, it must always return the same output value. So that seems reasonable enough. That seems intuitive if you think about mathematical functions, like if you add two numbers together, you know, two plus two is always four. Uh, so that seems reasonable. If you want to reverse a string, you know, the reverse of foo is always oof. So that also seems to be reasonable enough. Those, those are deterministic functions. Um, but we are quite strict in our interpretation of what we mean by functions being deterministic. So let's take another example. Now imagine that you have a function called uh, read reservations. And read reservation is going to query a database for a particular time slot, and it's going to return the number of already existing reservations. 
Um, so you could call read reservations for the 1st of December in 2017. And if you did that yesterday, maybe it returned five. And now you say, well, I, I wonder what hap what's going to happen if I call it again today. So I'm going to call read reservations for the 1st of December, and now it returns eight. And we sort of, you know, everyone who's ever done any, any sort of database uh, development knows what's happened here because someone added another reservation to the database. So the state of the database changed, and therefore we're getting a new response, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, compared to yesterday. But that's not considered deterministic, even though, you know, we would say, if we, if we know how database, uh, database development works, uh, we would say, well, that's deterministic because it just depends on the state of the database. Um, but the database is not considered to be part of the function, so that's external to the function. So that's actually not considered to be a deterministic function. So you can't query databases with pure functions. You can't read the contents of files. You can't really get any sort of user input with a pure function because that's non-deterministic. Um, but it gets even worse because the other rule for pure functions is that it can have no side effects. And a side effect is anything that changes the observable state of your system. Um, so if you want to add a row to a database, that's a side effect. If you want to send an email, that's a side effect. If you want to change a pixel on your monitor, that's a side effect. Um, so, so you can't do those uh, things either. So in themselves, pure functions are utterly useless. Uh, you can't even call them because they're, they're so restricted. Um, so we know that you know, functional programmers aren't you know, more ivory tower uh, architects than uh, we do understand that in themselves, pure functions are not particularly useful. They have lots of other good qualities, and that's why we prefer them, but we do understand we also need impure functions. And, what, and what's an impure function? Well, that's just a normal method, just like you know them from C Sharp or Java or whatever. Uh, there's no rule for impure functions. You can do whatever you want to do with impure functions. So there's a couple of, of things about functional programming that re relates to pure and impure functions. The first one is that we want to maximize the amount of pure code that we have, and we want to minimize the amount of impure code that we have, because pure functions have lots of other good qualities. So that's one, uh, one thing. The other thing is that there are rules for how these things interact. Now, if you have two pure functions and you want to call one pure function from another one, that's possible because it's not going to change that the caller is pure, that the other one is also pure because it's still going to be no side effects. It's going to be deterministic, so that, that works. And if you have two impure functions, well, one impure function can call another one because there are no rules. It also means that you can call a pure function from an impure function because, again, there are no rules for impure functions. So it doesn't change the pure function that is being called, and there are no rules for impure functions, so that's fine. Um, but the fourth combination is not possible. That's, that's not allowed. You can't call an impure function from a pure function because if you imagine that you could, the pure function would become side effect or you know there would be some sort of non-deterministic behavior. So that's not, that's not possible. So this is basically my criterion for evaluating whether or not a code is functional. If it obeys this rule, then the code is functional. If it doesn't obey this rule, it's not as functional. It's probably not functional then. Um, so it'd be really nice um, if we could look at our F-sharp code and say, well, is there some sort of sanity check we can take, you know, is there a tool that we can run on F-sharp to tell us whether or not we obey this rule? And there really isn't, because the <laughs> the problem with f if you will, is that f is a very friendly language. It's just, um, it, it's a very productive language. It's basically just interested in, in you getting stuff done. If you want to do functional programming, it's very happy to enable you to do that. If you want to do object-oriented programming in f you can do that as well. Um, so it's, it does, it's not really particularly concerned with this rule. It's just concerned with being productive. So very friendly, um, but uh, not that rigid. Uh, so there's no real uh, way that we can do this sort of sanity check in f -sharp. But it turns out that there's a little bit of an escape hatch still, because if you write your F-sharp code in a sufficiently functional style, what you can do is you can port the, the code to Haskell, because Haskell actually enforces this rule. Uh, so uh, let's try to see what that looks like. So um, I'm not assuming that you can read Haskell either. Um, so again, I'm just going to talk you through the important parts of it. And basically, the important part of, of the try accept uh, function here is just the top line that just gives you the type of the function. Uh, so a couple of things changed here. It's not called date time offset anymore. It's called zone time. A reservation list is not written as reservation space list. It's just reservation with square brackets around. Every time you see square brackets in, in Haskell, it just means a list of that type. Um, and uh, it's not called int option, it's called maybe int. Uh, but that's basically the same. Apart from that, it's, it's pretty much the same thing that's going, going on here. What's really interesting is that this function is pure. 
So how do we know that? Well, we know this because all functions in Haskell are pure by default. So unless you explicitly declare them to be impure, they're just going to be pure by default. And I'm, I'll show you what it looks like to explicitly declare them to be impure uh, a little later. Uh, but this one is pure because no explicit declaration of impurity is happening here. Not only that, but the two functions that we're injecting, if we will, uh, are pure as well by the same line of argument. There's no declaration of impurity, and uh, therefore they're pure. So that's fine. So far, so good. Uh, we have a pure function, takes four arguments, uh, so we can see can we still make the composition. Now, if we want to make the composition to actually query and update a real database, we know that that's not going to be possible with a pure function. So we know that the composition needs to be impure, and that's fine because the entry point of, an, of a Haskell program is always impure anyway. Now, the way that we ex explicitly declare that this composition is going to be impure is that we add the return type uh, IO. So it's not returning a maybe of int, it's returning an IO of a maybe of int. So those two letters, IO, indicates that it's impure. So we can try to do the same thing as we did in F sharp. We can say, well, what if we have a, re uh, a DB module and we can partially apply the read reservations function with a connection string? Uh, we would get uh, this back. So we would get a function back that takes a zone time as input and returns an IO of a reservation list as output. So IO, because it's impure, because it's non-deterministic, you know, when you call the function may actually influence uh, the answer you get back. Uh, so that's why it's, it's impure. Now, the same thing goes for uh, create reservation. Um, if you partially apply that with the connection string, you get a function back that takes a reservation as input and returns IO of int as output. IO because it's, it has a side effect. It creates a new row in a database. So let's recap. We can try to make the composition as we did before, um, but what was it that we needed? Well, read ought to have been a function from zone time to reservation list. Create should be a function from reservation to int. So you'll notice that the types don't line up. It's, they're, they're not the same types. And, and you know, if, you, if you're used to you know, looking and squinting a little bit of things and maybe you know, looking at generics in C Sharp and so on, you might say, well, but can we just you know, somehow remove the IO and then it sort of magically works anyway? No. That's the whole point. This doesn't compile. Th these aren't the same types. And there is a reason for that, because this is actually how Haskell enforces the rule that you cannot call impure functions from pure functions. You cannot call, pass an impure function to a pure function and expect it to be able to do anything with it. And that's what, what we try to do uh, here. So while partial application is dependency injection in F sharp, it's actually not functional. It doesn't work because you can't port it to Haskell. Haskell is very rigid about these things. It's a totally unforgiving language, uh, which makes it a beautiful language. Um, the way that we can try to get an intuition about this is if, if we think about dependency injection, what we can often do with dependency injection is we can envision it as a graph. Uh, so the point of this graph here is that on the left-hand side, you can th think of the box on the left-hand side as being your root object. This might be your controller class or the entry point in your application, uh, whatnot. So each of those uh, objects here, the root object has two dependencies, and the dependencies have dependencies themselves, and so on and so on. Uh, and in the leaf nodes, this is typically where you'd have all sorts of things that talk to databases and send emails and stuff like that. Basically, all sorts of things that are impure is going to happen uh, out there in the leaf nodes. Now, if you have something that has an impure dependency or depends on something impure, it wants to be able to call it, the only way that it can do that is by itself being impure. So it's totally infectious. If the leaf nodes are impure, the entire graph becomes impure. So dependency injection makes everything impure. And this is actually quite interesting. I did not understand this myself until I tried to make this port to Haskell, because I'd actually been doing this F-sharp partial application trick for uh, at least a year, or maybe, maybe a little bit more, until I, I said, you know, well, I wonder what happens if I try to port this to Haskell. And then I realized, hey, this actually doesn't work because of this. Um, so if Sharp is friendly and productive, but uh, it, doesn't enforce, uh, it doesn't force you to be functional. Uh, but now we understand that this actually doesn't work. All right, how much time do I have? OK, fine. All right, so, um, so we'll need to figure out a new way to do that. We'll need to reject dependencies, the notion of dependencies. But we'll still need to figure out a way how, how to address the concerns that we have about decoupling and testability and separation of concerns and so on. So how do we do that? 
So in order to answer that question, let's go back to basics. So one of the first things you probably learned when you learned about uh, how to do software development was that you learned that there are sometimes you need you have blocks of code that you want to be able to reuse. Um, so you can extract those reusable blocks of code into sub-procedures or um, you know, sub-routines or procedures or methods or functions or whatever you want to call those things. Well, let's just call them a unit. This is a, unit, a reusable unit of, of code. And in most languages, how this works is that they take some input and return some output. So methods in C Sharp take you know, input arguments and, and have return values. So that's basically the idea about that. Now, if you're doing dependency injection, you also have dependencies, and you need to interact with those dependencies. So if you think about the matrix object that you saw before, for example, one of the first things that it does is it queries its repository, and it gets a list of reservations back from the repository. We call this indirect input. And likewise, if you think about the matrix object from before, sometimes it decides to accept the reservation, and when it does that, it tells the repository that it should create the reservation in the database. So we call that indirect output. So this complicates things a bit. And if you're doing testing of this, well, you're doing unit testing, um, where you ho have that indirect input and output, this is where you need your stops and mocks. So it's not that in impossible to unit test, but it just makes unit testing more hard than it ought to be. Um, so, um, so let's see, why do we do that? Well, how, why, do we think, why do we make things complicated? Well, one of the reasons is if we start with the indirect output, one of the reasons we do that, if you think about the matrix D object again, we have to make a decision, do we have enough remaining capacity to accept the reservation, and only in that case do we want to save uh, the new reservation into the database. So we sort of have to make a decision and then you know, cause an effect to happen uh, based on that decision. And uh, in statement-based languages like C Sharp, for example, it's not the easiest thing in the world to separate a decision from the side effect you want it to have. So that's sort of how or why we tend to do things in this particular way. Uh, but in languages like F Sharp and Haskell, you know, that's, that's trivial. We can trivially um, separate the decision from the effect that we want the effect to have. So I'll show you what that looks like first, and then we can look at the other arrow uh, later on. So, um, so we'll go back to the try accept F sharp code there and, and see where is the indirect uh, output. Well, the indirect output is there in the create reservation function. So basically what I want to do here now, I want to remove that function. I don't want to have to call this function anymore. Now, you'll probably notice that the, the function returns an int. That's where the integer comes from that is being returned by the function itself, the int option. Uh, so we'll have to change the, the type a little bit because we can't return an int if we're not calling create reservation. So I'm going to remove the function, and I'm going to change the return type of the uh, this overall function to a reservation option. So it's going to return a reservation option. Um, and basically, the idea here is if it returns some reservation, that is an indication that we've decided to accept the reservation. And if it returns none, it means we've decided not to accept the reservation. Um, we can move that in one line. So um, with that change, the first uh, line of code remains the same, but then in the then uh, clause there, uh, we don't call create reservation because that function is gone. So we just say, we'll, we'll take the reservation, we'll set is accepted to true, and then we'll just you know, pipe that into sum. Uh, so in that case, when we decide to accept the reservation, it's a sum reservation, else it's none. Okay? So now we have a function that takes three arguments. So remove one of the arguments. So how do we compose that? So I'm aiming for the same composition as before. I want to, to remain, uh, I want this to be a true refactoring. I, I don't want to change the abstraction, and I don't want to change the behavior. I just want to change how I factor the code. So I can call my new version of try accept with all three arguments. So I can say try accept 10, and then the partially applied function db read reservations uh, applied with a connection string, and then the third argument is reservation. So this is a full function call. It only takes three arguments now, and it returns a reservation option. And you'll notice that I've surrounded this function call with match with, and uh, that means I can do what's called pattern matching. So I'm just going to say, well, if the return value is none, I'm just going to return a new none. Uh, but if it's sum, I can pull the R, the reservation inside the sum case, I can pull it out of it again, and I can use that as an input argument to db create reservation, partially applied with the connection string. And that's going to return an integer, you know, the ID that's created in the database, and then I'll just take that integer and put that in a new sum case. 
And in functional programming, we do this all the time. We take none and translate that to none, and we take sum and we call some function on the value inside of the sum case, and then we put it into a new sum case. This happens all the time. So in F-sharp, we can rewrite this to just say option map. And in Haskell, this is called uh, you know, a, a if map, uh, but never mind that. Um, so we do this all the time. So, uh, so that's basically how that works. Uh, and we can also take, um, you'll notice that there is a, an R on both sides there, so we can do an eta reduction and just make that a little prettier. That's not really important. We can take the reservation and move it up here and pipe it so that we have multiple pipes. You'll see me do uh, this again uh, later on. This is just a different way of writing the same thing. Right, so this is how we get rid of indirect output. So can we also get rid of indirect input? Well, if you think about the maitre d' example here, it's calling uh, a function to get the list of reservations from the database, and then it uses that list of reservations to do whatever it is it, it needs to do. Why do we need the unit to make that function call? Why can't we just say, well, someone else needs to do this uh, in, before we call the unit, and then we can just turn that into direct input instead? Uh, that would be much easier. You'll notice that if we can do that, there's no longer any arrows between the unit and dependencies, so we can reject the dependencies. Um, so that's just going to make the code much simpler, and you'll also notice if you want to test it, it's just going to make unit testing so much easier. So, uh, so what would that look like? So we'll go back to the um, version of try except where we left it off before, and the place where we have indirect input is in this read reservations um, function there. And basically, uh, the reason why it's a function at the moment is because it takes date time offset as, as an input value. And I basically say, well, I don't want this to be a function. I just care about the return value. That's the only thing I want. So I'm just going to say, let's not have it, make it a function. I just want it to be a value. And if it's just a value, it's really strange that it's called read reservation. Uh, so I should probably rename it to just reservations instead. Just do that. So, um, so that's, that's much simpler. So the code now looks like this. We still just take the reservations, do a sum over the quantities, and then we're basically done. We can move these things around so that it fits on one line. That's better. Now, um, how do we compose that then? Well, I'm still aiming for a refactoring. I'm still aiming for the same abstraction, the same behavior. So another way to factor this is we can start with the reservation date. And I'll pipe the reservation date, just a little bit like you saw before. I'll pipe the reservation date into DB read reservations partially applied with a connection string. Now, this partially applied function is a function that takes a daytime offset value as input, but that's what we just piped to it, and then it returns a reservation list as output. So this whole expression returns a reservation list. And we can pipe that reservation list into a lambda expression. And the lambda expression says, well, you know, every time I get a reservation, I'm going to call try accept 10 reservations reservation. The, so that's the try accept function that, that you've just seen. And uh, that returns a reservation option. Um, and we can just pipe, uh, pipe that into option map just like you saw before. So this, again, does exactly the same thing as before. And it's just a different way of, of factoring things. Um, so a couple of things that I want to do. I have time, yes. Um, so the first uh, 10 or maybe 100 times you write a lambda expression, you think it's really, really cool, and then you start to become really, really tired of looking at lambda expressions. Uh, so I wonder whether or not we can refactor those a little bit. Um, so you'll notice that it says reservations on both sides of that you know, lambda expression there in the middle. Um, so could we do an eta reduction of that? Uh, unfortunately, we can't really do that. Um, because it's not in the right place. It, you know, reservations need to be on, at the rightmost place in both uh, cases, and that's, that's not the case here. So there's a little trick we can do that. We can define a little helper function called flip, and uh, not to make a long story out of it, but flip just takes a function, a function that takes two arguments, and it returns a new function uh, that does exactly the same thing as the input function, but expects the arguments in flipped order, you know, in, in reverse order. So it'd be nice if we could do that. Um, so um, try accept, unfortunately, is a function that takes three arguments. Uh, so we can't really flip try accept because flip only flips things that take two arguments. Uh, but we can partially apply try accept with 10. Uh, if we do that, we get a function that takes two arguments, and then we can flip that. So if you didn't quite catch that, uh, this is basically just me showing off anyway. Uh, but this is, it's a fairly you know, normal thing to do in, in, um, in functional programming, because now we can make an easy reduction, and then everything is much prettier. Um, there's a little bit of a, a reason why I'm showing you this, because flip try accept 10 reservations will be um, something that is, will be a little bit of a fixed point for you that you can remember, uh, because now I'm going to try to see whether this is actually portable to Haskell. All right, so, um, so let's see if we can port this to Haskell. 
So uh, first of all, let's try and see if we can uh, port try accept to Haskell code. So that wasn't a really uh, that wasn't a problem before. Uh, this turns out to still not be a problem. Uh, that that this particular function still is still pure and it still compiles and and all is good. So where we had problems before when we tried to to port the code was that um, in the composition we couldn't make the composition work because you couldn't pass impure functions to pure functions. Uh, but let's see the new version that we have here where we sort of pipe things through whether, whether that translates. Um, so not to make a long story out of it, uh, the composition ends up looking like this. And um, don't worry about all those weird looking arrows and dollar signs and all sorts of other things. That's just Haskell glue that sort of makes things uh, you know, click together uh, in a structured way. Um, but this actually compiles, so that's the basic uh, major message of that. This actually compiles. And you can probably you know, recognize this flip try except 10 reservation there in the middle, uh, so you can sort of recognize uh, the same sort of steps uh, that you saw from the F-sharp code before. So what, often, what I often find happens when I write Haskell code is that there's a core in the middle of my entry point. You can think of this as something that sits fairly close to the entry point of the application. And in the middle of my composition, there's a pure core of the application, if you will. So try accept is a pure function. And basically, all of this is just glue that, that makes uh, calling that a pure function possible. And the reason why we can do this is because the method that we're looking at at the moment is impure, and it can call, you know, there are no rules for impure functions, so they can call pure functions as well. But what they can also do is they can do some, uh, you know, impure steps before and after. So before it calls the pure function, it gets all sorts of, of, of data ready from all sorts of impure sources, from runtime input values and from querying a database and so on. And once it do it's done that, it passes all those values to a pure function call. The pure function call returns, and it does some more impure stuff uh, with the p return value from the pure function call afterwards. Um, so I call this an Im impure, pure, Im impure sandwich, because it's a little bit like a sandwich. Um, I don't know if you know why a sandwich is called a sandwich. Um, but the reason for that was that the, um, there was a, an English nobleman called the Earl of Sandwich. So Sandwich is actually a place in England. And um, he was a notorious gambler. It's many, many hundred years ago. He was a notorious gambler. He liked to play uh, cards. Uh, so he was sitting there playing cards with his other noble friends. And uh, they were playing for hours and hours and hours. And you know, once in a while, they'd get hungry. But they, he didn't want to interrupt the game to eat. Um, so he wanted to have something to eat where he could eat at the same time as actually playing cards. Uh, so he asked his servants to come up with something he could eat in a way that he wouldn't you know, grease his cards because you know, greasy cards are you know, sort of um, not particularly good to play with because now you can see whether, you know, what the other people have. Uh, so they came up with this idea of taking two slices of bread and putting all the greasy stuff in, in the middle, all the good stuff in the middle, but then you know, protecting the good stuff uh, with the pieces of bread so that it, it wouldn't be greasy uh, overall. And all the friends uh, saw uh, that he got those things, so when the servants asked them um, uh, you know, what they wanted to eat, they just say, I'll just have what sandwich has, because they just t called each other by their noble names. So that became known as a sandwich. So this is a little bit the same thing. Um, I think it's also a little bit related to the arrange act assert pattern that you may know from unit testing. You sort of arrange a lot of data, and you pull the data from all sorts of impure sources. Then you pass it to a pure function, and then you do some more impure stuff with it afterwards. So it's sort of like the same three-step uh, process that you go through. Right, I am running out of time, so let's um, wrap this up. So just to uh, make sure that everyone uh, understood the core message of this talk, if you're doing object-oriented programming, um, don't be ashamed or, or anything about doing dependency injection. It's a battle-tested and well-described way of dealing with decoupling, separation of concerns, testability, those sorts of things. It's fine, and you can you know, read my book if you want to know how to do that. There's a second edition on the way, by the way. Um, if you're doing functional programming, how you solve the same problems depend a little bit on what sort of functional programming you're doing. If you're doing non-strict functional programming, like for example with F-sharp, you can use partial application in the way that I've shown you, um, and that turns out to correspond to dependency injection. It also turns out to be not functional in the sense that used in this particular way, partial, function, uh, partial application uh, makes everything impure. So, so that would actually not be a way to do things. Uh, so you can, instead, if you really want to be truly functional, you can use function composition. This impure 
pure impure sandwich. And this is basically uh, what I, how, I, how I write uh, most, most of my F sharp code these days, uh, and, and also my Haskell code, obviously. Now, um, if you want to know more about this, uh, if you go to blog.plur.dk, there is an art article called From Dependency Injection to Dependency Rejection, and that's just a placeholder article that actually has you know, links to several other articles that is going to walk you through all of this. Um, there's going to be, uh, there, there, are, there is already, uh, these articles already exist, and there are links to the source code. If you want to look at the source code, uh, they're in GitHub repositories and so on. Um, so that's basically uh, what I have. Uh, I should also put, point out, by the way, that I did bring a, a limited supply of fsharp.org stickers. So if anyone wants an fsharp.org sticker, then uh, you can come up you know, either just after the talk, or you know, if you see me some other time during the conference, you can come, just come and ask me whether I have more of those. Uh, so I'll be happy to, to hand those out. Uh, so with that, I, my watch says that I may have a couple of minutes left. So uh, that means I may have time for questions. Do I have? Yes, yes, yes I do Mark. have time for questions. Yeah. Okay, all right. So, um, any questions then? Uh, yes, Mark. We have a question from our uh, uh, online uh, watchers. What do you think about uh, direct usage DB from logic layer without repositories? When I choose repositories way, I had difficulties with using special ORM features. Building effective queries with help of IQ queryable or wait, making wait, repositories. Wait, 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 can you hold on a minute? Okay. No. I, I'll need to come over and, and, and be closer to you because the, the speakers go that way. I actually can't hear what ah, you're saying. Okay. So you can probably hear what I say. Can, so. uh, what do you think about direct usage DB from logic layer without repositories? And the situation, when I choose repositories way, I had difficulties with using special ORM features building effective queries with help of IQ Recurable, making repositories interfaces convenient, and lose speed of development. Can you think about ORM as self-sufficient database abstraction and about ORM collections? Right, so there's a, there's a lot of questions there, and I couldn't really hear all of it because it's still, you know, the sound quality is not, not, not that good. But I did pick up the word ORIM, you know, Optical Relational Mapper, and I think you know, the, the, the answer to this is basically just don't do that. I mean, really, I mean, we... <laughs> No, I, I mean, I'm not even kidding, you know. It's, it's sort of like we've been having this thing, so I think Ted Neward wrote this blog post called the, uh, oh, the Vietnam War of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of Programming or something like that. It's basically like, like the, the, the Vietnam War, you know, so, so that's probably an analogy that makes most sense to US audiences anyway, but it's just, just like, you know, it's one of those things where if you, if you talk about the concept of an, of an optic relation map, it says anyone who hears about this concept says, I could write one of those things myself, but it always turns out that it's much, 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 harder than you think it is. And they, really, there are no good ORM mappers, and uh, you just, I mean, they're trying to solve a problem that you should not have in the first place. Uh, I would also say, you know, if you're using F Sharp, by the way, you can use this thing uh, in F Sharp called, uh, you know, type providers, uh, that'll give you much uh, better and uh, clear and type safe access to, to all sorts of, of uh, you know, uh, external data. And I believe there's a session either today and tomorrow or tomorrow about F Sharp type providers, so you should definitely go to that.